Greetings, Kerbonauts! This is Kerbal Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch, and this is episode number three of the Remastered Project Gateway. In the last episode, we were just getting started with the Zvezda launch. If this were real life, it would be July 12th, 2000. It launched on a Proton K from Kazakhstan and docked 14 days later. Our version is heading up on a KLS-4. And you'll see that once again, it's heading for the station before mission control is under the orbit. Now this is okay for me because the launchers I have contain way more fuel than they really need. And in fact, this saves time because the launches are happening as the station is passing overhead. I would not be able to do this on Earth in real solar system because the cost of the inclination change would be too much. But on Kerbin, I can get away with it. That means we can rendezvous directly from the surface and not go into a phasing orbit first. A typical Earth, and therefore Kerbin, phasing orbit is when you launch lower than the station you're targeting. Once there, you let time go by until your rendezvous is set up. Then, you burn again to intercept the target orbit. You burn a third time to raise up and match speeds. If you're really low and your rendezvous relative velocity would be too high, you can move into a second intermediate phasing orbit first, after that, the rendezvous I just described would be the same as usual. If you're curious about the estimated extra cost of doing it the way that I'm doing it here, we can take a quick look at the math of it. So I guess I should say, warning, math content ahead. Let's say that we're going exactly east, meeting the station's orbit off by 51.6 degrees. Let's also say we're in an elliptical orbit going from zero kilometers because we just launched and so one end of it's on the surface up to 180 kilometers which is the altitude of the station. Normally the circularization cost would be this. I use a spreadsheet for this. We're going to need to know our apoapsis and our periapsis altitudes. So I'll put those in as kilometers. We have 0 and 180 kilometers. We also need to know the radius from the center of Kerbin to calculate our velocities. So this will be 600 kilometers plus the distance from the center, and that'll give us our radii. We're going to use those to calculate our velocity in meters per second at those locations. To do that, we're going to need our semi-major axis, which is the average of these two values, we're also going to need to know Kerbin's gravitational constant. It's 3.5316 e to the 12. We can get the velocity by taking the square root of the gravitational constant of Kerbin, or the planet you're orbiting, times 2 over the radius of where we are, minus 1 over the semi-major axis. That gives us one velocity. We can use that same formula to calculate the second velocity at the other altitude. So if we're launching and our periapsis is at the ground, our apoapsis at 180 kilometers means we'll be traveling 1,984 meters per second when we get there. If we take all of this and we duplicate it down here so that I can then see what would we be doing if we were going 180 by 180, you can see that our velocity will become circular. It's the same at both ends, 2128 meters per second. If we then subtract those two where we take the speed that we want to be going minus the speed that we are going when we start, we're going to get 144 meters per second is how much delta V we need to circularize our orbit from this 180 by 0 to 180 by 180. Okay, so that's what I'd like to be spending, but what if I have an angle of 51.6 degrees difference, which is what I showed a moment ago, where if we were flying east, but then we hit the station's orbit and we had to change our inclination, how much would that cost? Well, to do that, we're going to need to know the cosine of that angle. So let me calculate that right here. And then with that, we can use a formula that figures out the delta for an inclination change all by itself, just for curiosity. We're not actually going to have to do this we would be changing our altitude at the same time. But if we wanted to know, then we can see what it is. It would be the square root of 2 times the velocity that we're currently going squared times 1 minus 
that cosine value that we just figured out, and you're going to see that the inclination change all by itself would cost 1,727 meters per second. But we're not actually going to do that. We are going to combine our maneuvers together. So in order to know the combined maneuver cost, we need to know our two velocities. And remember, we just calculated one. One of them is this 1984, and the one we're ending in is this 2128. To get the delta v that we need to go from one to the other, we're going to use the cosine rule. We're going to do the square root of the first velocity squared plus the second velocity squared minus two times the first velocity times the second velocity times the cosine. And so we get 1794 meters per second. That's the inclination change and the orbit change at the same time. If we want to know then the difference of them, we can simply take this minus this and see that the additional cost would have been 1651. Now, in reality, I didn't go directly 90 degrees. I went way higher than that. And maybe the inclination change was, I don't know, let's say 20 degrees difference. So that would have been a 728. So the extra cost was 584 meters per second. That's not that much actually in terms of Kerbal Space Program because launchers there have so much delta V on them. If I were doing a real solar system, as I said earlier, this would actually be a lot of delta V to try to fit onto a real solar system launch. But on Kerbin, I can totally get away with it. Back in space, after meeting the station's orbit, we released the injection stage, and it's going to go deorbit. And I'm sure Bill will be very happy that we're continuing to deorbit our space junk. Meanwhile, the Zvezda continues its rendezvous all by itself. We needed to deploy a few little toys on the Zvezda. There's a little antenna on the back that rotated out and it's helping to maintain our remote tech connection. We also have some low gain antennas and those solar panels are now out. There are monopropellant engines for matching speed with the station and RCS of course to finish rendezvous and docking. The antenna at the bottom will point to one of the two geosynchronous satellites that we launched in episode one. After we launch the Z1 truss in a future episode, we'll have a second dish that we can point at the second geostationary satellite. Here you can also see me creating a new custom MechJeb window. I was still a novice to video making and had not decided yet that I preferred the single flight computer window that I do today. Instead back then I had a ton of smaller windows all over the place. I eventually decided that it looked too cluttered and started trimming down to fewer windows until eventually I went with just one, and to this day that's all I do, just the one. That's why I like MechJeb over Kerbal Engineer actually, for the displaying of stats, because you can pick exactly what lines you want to show in your one small window with MechJeb. In this case, I labeled the window Space Station, and it's filled in with lines like crew count and crew capacity and part count. The part count will allow me to keep an eye on ensuring we're keeping the station playable with a reasonable frame rate. We're ready to dock now, but first we'll stop by the VAB and look at what we're docking. Here we can see the Zvezda up close. We'll skip the KLS-4 because it was covered in episode 1. Zvezda's broken into just a few pieces. The head is one welded piece and the tail is another welded piece. By doing that, I was able to keep the entire module down to just 38 parts. Most of the parts are from life support and engines because between the head and the tail, there will be a cargo bay where life support goes, simulating how this module was used for life Life support in real life. If I did this today, I'd weld it all together and just add life support to the one welded body. I'd even have the engines welded in and one docking port welded in. Looking at the head, you can see it's the most complicated of the two halves. It has docking attachments, batteries, ladders, and other greebly little bits on the outside, such as lights. Because, as you know, you gotta have more lights. There's an infernal robotics rototron on the tail that allows the lower antenna to be extended away from the body. And here's the cargo hold I mentioned. It contains life support from TAC, but uses custom textures. Again, today, I'd just make the whole module contain life support and save on the part count. But back then, it was four parts. We have one for wastewater to clean water conversion, one water splitter to make oxygen, 
one CO2 scrubber that will also create breathable oxygen, and finally, food, oxygen, and water in a supply tank. I'm using the Navy Fish Docking Alignment Indicator mod, which at the time was the first time that I had used that mod. Now it feels like second nature, but at the time, I remember it being a little tricky to learn. First you use ASWD to get the orange one right in the center, and once you have that one, now you can try to maneuver to get the rest of the station there. You do that by using your J, K, I, and L to force the little yellow indicator that shows where the nose of your craft is. You get that down in the section that's defined by the green lines here and the middle, which you now have your orange thing on. If you want to rotate the craft to line up your nodes, that's this indicator right here. You can roll the craft until it moves over to whichever alignment you want it, up, down, left, right, whichever. In my case, I did need to get that lined up. And then finally, because this yellow thing is over here in this section, what's going to happen is the green lines are going to move closer and closer toward the center. You can ease off on the velocity with your RCS by bringing it back over here toward the middle as it gets closer. And eventually the green lines will line up right on top of the orange marker in the middle. And that's when you want to make sure that your yellow has been brought all the way back to the center so you've lined everything up. The orange marker, the yellow marker, the green lines, and potentially even the rotation indicator. Keep it lined up like that and you're going to eventually dock. Zvizda needs to line up just right with Zarya to create the proper alignment of its solar panels. Unfortunately, I finished the docking only to realize it was 180 degrees upside down. Ah, so the panels were lined up, but the antenna was sticking out on the same side as the docking port. And in all the pictures online, the antenna is sticking out on the side without a docking port. So I had to undock, rotate, and redock because I'm a compulsive stickler for details. I'm also a big fan of lights. Project Gateway is where my love of lights in KSP began. And the best lights mod that I had ever found was this one, the Surface Lights mod. It has a single point omni light, a four way omni light, and one, a one way surface illuminator. Because I love lights, I also have them turned up to max in the settings. On the graphics config page, there's a slider for pixel light count, and I set mine as high as it goes. But Surface Lights is not the only mod with more lights. You'll sometimes see me using B9. They have some massive directional lights and some good ones for mounting on ceilings in my interlude sets. They have some tiny little dome lights that I used to use before I found Surface Lights. The B9 dome lights were cool because they also had green and red lights before you could tweak the colors in stock. Another way to get colored lights back then was to use the battery for its little green glow or the aviation lights mod that had several different colors. In real life, a plane needs lights on it in various places to let others know the direction it's traveling and where it is relative to you. It's more complicated than this, but put simply, a red light on the left wing, a green light on the right wing, and a white light in the back. There's technically a lot more than that, but those are the main ones, and those let you know the direction it's traveling. Computer, call Arden. Joseph, what can I do for you? We should talk about next steps. I was stopped, but it was after the upload, and they couldn't hold me. Now we'll move on to phase two of the plan, if you're ready for your part. Okay folks, that's going to do it. We've launched the Zvizda module, it's docked up. We can take a look at it here, it's so beautiful. And then next episode, we can launch the Z1 Truss, and see a little bit more about what Joseph is planning. Until next time, I will see you later, Kerbinauts. <laughs>